I'm here again with Big Paul, and today we were going to talk about some training stuff. What's going on, Paul? What's going on? So we'll talk about training. I I get tired of talking about steroids, Kurt. I know people love hearing about steroids, but I do love training and I love nutrition. Yeah, Tra so that's, I think we had some requests to do some training stuff because people are sick of listening to the steroid stuff as well. <laughs> I mean, I get tired of talking about it. I do love training a lot, and I've going down the rabbit hole quite a bit. I, I read, I actually probably read more about training than I do PED stuff, surprisingly, but I've read tons and tons of books on training and I talk to a lot of people about training. I'm not proclaiming to be the world's foremost expert, but I have tried it all and some of it works better than others. I know a lot of guys get angry at me about talking about HIT training and they, they think, think think I'm poo-pooing all over HIT training, but I did it for years. I, I did HIT training for years, and it worked. But I just don't think at the point where I'm at right now, it's it's an appropriate way to train or yeah. at least sustainable way to train at my age. Yeah. I think similar training probably unlike nutrition, though, there's probably more variation in what, what could work, right? It's not to say right. it's optimal, but I think – from like a biological point of view, we're all about the same when it comes to food. There's, there's a definitely reason why most guys eat exactly the same. There is more variation within training, although you see, as you and I are aware, there's there's more similarities probably into what most successful bodybuilders do in the gym versus the yeah. outliers, right? And that yeah. tends to be some sort of higher volume stuff, typically. Yeah, moderate, I would say moderate to high volume stuff. I, you know, pretty much every pro bodybuilder you see is doing some variation of moderate to high volume. And, and people love to point to the outliers. They love to point, like, you know, everybody says Dorian Yates, Dorian Yates, Dorian Yates. He was one of in, right? right? It, one, one guy that's had success training that way it, on and made it to the Olympia stage and won the mr olympia title training that way he's really it when you think about it i don't think there's been anybody else that's trained that way that's been a high level olympia competitor and people like to say mike menser but mike menser did not train that way on his way up he yeah. he didn't really develop his hit training until after maybe his last year i think he talked about how he burnt himself out um, but I, that's not to say that you can't grow that way. I do think that you can grow with HIIT training. And I have a bit of a controversial take on on training and its role in hypertrophy. I out of the I see there's three components that make people grow. You have nutrition, you have you have hormone optimization, and then you have training. And I'll be honest with you, I think training is the least important out of the three. I would agree with that. <laughs> and it's, I know that's a controversial take. Like people get very upset when they hear that. And I'm not saying it's not important, but out of the three that I've seen, if your hormones aren't optimized, it doesn't matter how hard you train, you're not yep. going to grow. If you're not eating properly, it doesn't matter how hard you train or what your training looks like, you're not going to grow. So to me, that puts it a little lower on the totem pole. And now, in just pulling pulling things back and looking at it at, at a thirty thousand foot view, I the way I view training is we're providing stimulus to put all those other factors at work, right? Where training is the stimulus to put the PEDs to work, and nutrition is the fuel to you know basically basically uh, push all that. And I, Justin, I, my, my trainer, Justin Harris has a, has an analogy that he uses that it, it, think of it this way. It's think of your body as a construction site. Your food are the construction supplies, your, your, your wood, your bricks that you're building the house with. The PEDs are the construction workers, how many workers that you have on the site to build the house. And then the training is the foreman that's telling them what to do with all <laughs> of that. Mm -hmm. So if you have no supplies, no building supplies, if you don't have enough workers, it doesn't matter what you do. The house yeah. is not going to get built. Yeah. Bill Phillips. I don't know if you remember Bill Phillips. From yeah, oh, yeah. I read I read his books. Yeah. He he used to use the cigarette lighter analogy, which is funny because no one smokes anymore. Um, he basically said that you know trading was like the spark, the flint, and the food was the fuel, right? You have no flame without either. 
Yep, right. That's true. That's You'll true. wear the flint down without the fuel. But I, yeah, I, I definitely agree. And I think food is probably of those three variables. Food is the most important. I, w- I would say so too. Food is probably the most important. Everyone lacks, right? It's more, or maybe we could phrase it. They're all probably maybe they're equally important, but food is where people go wrong most often. Yeah, discipline. Food is the, the most neglected aspect of it. I, most people, most people are training. Most people that are serious about this are probably training hard enough to to provide enough stimulus to grow. And, and to be honest with you, as I found out, you don't actually have to train super hard to grow. And a lot of the modern research is showing that now with reps and reserve. I think what was it anything? You know, there was a meta study. I, I think I saw I have James Krieger coming on tomorrow. Or, or yeah, I think that's who it is. But anyway. Uh, talking to Dr. Mike Israel, it, it really anything within four reps of failure is probably enough stimulus to promote growth. Yeah, probably. I think where we where we probably run into problems though is in the interpretation of that, right? So you and I know what you've been lifting long enough. You know what four reps in reserve is. Yeah, right, right. right. Whereas it someone who's very new at this, if you were to say that, it would like they're basically just stopping because they got bored. They don't understand as they approach it. Right, failure. yeah. And even the definition of failure, um, Paul Carter had an interesting way to explain failure. Failure is basically task failure. It's when you can no longer properly complete the task. It doesn't mean right. your form has gone to shit and that you're, you're, you're making crazy faces and you're arching your back. It's like in a leg extension when you can no longer get your feet up parallel to the floor. That's failure. It doesn't mean that you working continually past that does not – is is – that's not, you've now gone past that point. Correct. Right. So yeah, I agree. You don't necessarily have to go to failure. It's just easier to just tell people to work harder. Yeah. And that's sort of the, you know, and I go back to the whole progressive overload thing and thinking about it, that is sort of a foolproof way of, of growing. If you've gotten stronger, if you've gotten bigger, if you've counted your reps and yada, yada, all that stuff, it's a, it's really the dummies formula to make sure that you're continuing to progress. But at, at a certain point, that becomes impossible. As you get to a certain size, you have to use different modalities. But really, the way I look at it at this point in my journey, I want to provide enough stimulus in the gym to promote growth without getting hurt. It's really that simple for me. I agree. It's yeah. it's really that simple. proper stimulus. Now I do think there there, you know, I don't want to oversimplify it. There's a lot of nuance to training. There's a lot of shit that you can fuck up with with training, especially when it comes to form and how you have structured your workouts, etc. For physique enhancement, um, I don't want to want people to think that I'm oversimplifying this. But at the end of the day, my goal is to provide the proper stimulus to the targeted muscle that I'm trying to grow without getting hurt. And then I'll let the food and PEDs do the work. Yep. I think that's where, that's where people probably go wrong though, is that they're, they're either not working hard enough or they don't have, they're not giving their body what it takes to actually support that reaction. And then they're, they're probably then doing, because there's also a point where it goes the other direction, right? That might be doing too much work. Like I would call right. major yeah. minors, or you see yeah. these these young natural guys that weigh 150 pounds that are now doing 20 sets of lateral raises, thinking yeah. that that's going to be the key, right? Because when we talk about moderate or high volume, as well, there's still a limit within that what you're doing, because after a certain point, it becomes very pointless. Yeah, and I also think where I see a lot of guys screw up, especially younger guys, is they get too focused on strength, and I'm not saying that progressing strength isn't important. Certainly, if you're a bigger human being, if you're more muscle, you're going to be able to generate more muscle. You're going to be able to generate more force. But I've seen a lot of power lifters that are very fucking strong that aren't that big. Yeah, yeah. My father was a my father was a, a record setter in the squat, and he was 147 pounds. Yeah. So you don't have to be the big to be a power lifter. Generate force. That's a lot of that's genetic. Genetic. Um, it's also movement, neuromuscular. It's uh, technique. There's a bunch of other things that are in it. It's, you know, I've seen this, I've seen some of these guys that are high level Olympic lifters that can move shit off the floor that I can never pick up no. and they're half my size. Yeah. But like you said, I think the strength thing is interesting, right? I think we all at least initially focus on that with progressive overload. And right. then we get to the certain point. I think 
for me, it was somewhere around the age of 45. My nervous system started to change a little bit and I just, I wasn't getting any stronger. So I don't look at, I don't look at the weight so much anymore. I look at more yeah. of the result, right? So I'm looking at the weight, the scale. I'm looking at how I look, how I feel, what my recovery is like. And, not, and I'm looking like, can I get more reps out of something? Yeah. But I'm not necessarily, I haven't gotten stronger either in the last 20 pounds. So it also shows that just putting muscle on doesn't necessarily equate to strength. Right. Right. It can, it can have a one-to-one -one correlation, but I, I generally have found that not to be true. I'm, I was way stronger in my twenties. Yeah. And of course I lift more like a power lifter than I guess power bodybuilder, whatever you want to call it. When I was doing hit style training and pounding the logbook, trying to beat the logbook every workout, I got really strong, but I'm bigger now. I'm lifting less weights. I'm not doing compound movements. There, there's a bunch of things that I've changed and I'm, I'm the biggest I've ever been. Yep. So describe, we probably do very similar stuff. Describe like what your week, what's, what's like a training week look like for you? I do a push pull legs routine and I train six days a week. I hit everything twice a week. So like people, I hear a lot of people say that you, know, you can't do that because of recovery and yada, yada. I, I'm 50 years old. I still train that way, man. I'm hitting everything twice a week. I will say this, that is a sliding scale based on how hard you're training. If you're training to absolute failure, going beyond failure, doing heavy compound movements that are going to tax your CNS, yep. you're going to need more time to recover. You can't do that. So what I have found to be effective for me at my age is keep a rep or two in, ta in the tank. I take a hard look at the the cost, the reward versus benefit ratio of, of an exercise. So for example, like I think about something like deadlifts. Deadlifts are extremely expensive as far as fatigue, CNS fatigue goes. Deadlifts have a very, very, very high, very taxing in the moment as far as just exhaustion goes. So if you're, if you're starting off your back workout with deadlifts, how well are you going to be able to do your rows and all your other movements at the end of towards the end of the workout? So I look at the cost versus benefit of an exercise. So if I'm going to, am I going to blow myself out for an entire workout doing a set of deadlifts and need an entire week to recover? Or would I be better off just not doing the deadlifts and doing some sort of braced row, yeah. holding a rep or two back and doing more volume and be able to train everything twice a week yeah. and yeah. get more stimulus. So I think you, I, I have found that I get more stimulus from skipping those high cost exercises and doing more volume with some of the other stuff. Now it's a line you got to walk. It is definitely a line you have to walk. And I, I've trained both ways. And I do think as you get older, you need to be more mindful of, of the fatigue costs and injury risk cost of, of an exercise. You can do that shit when you're 22. I mean, I was doing deadlifts and going out and drinking tequila shots and sleeping three hours and get up and do it all over again the next day when I was in my early twenties, I can't do that shit now. Yeah. And that's, and at the end of the day, a deadlift as well, not to pick on the deadlift, but the deadlift's a hip hinge. So it's not even a great back exercise. No, yeah. it's not. You know, And it's not to say that I don't do some deadlift style movements here and there. I'll do stiff legged like deadlifts for hamstrings. Um, but I, you know, I'm not deadlifting 600, 700 pounds anymore or doing any of that crazy shit. Same thing with, with, with squats. I look at squats as another exercise that's not, really that great for leg development <laughs> you see a lot of dudes a lot of dudes that are pro bodybuilders they don't squat at all dory nates mr hardcore that he everybody squat, loves yeah. he didn't do squats he did hack squats and it's the loading of your spine the axial loading that is risky and dangerous also heavy set of squats would you have been better off to do five sets of a hack squat for hypertrophy definitely for hypertrophy, right? Yeah. So the more the more stable an exercise is, the less your central nervous system needs to work, right? And it's focusing just on the muscles intended. Like a leg extension, your muscles very focused on your quadriceps versus your back and your abs, your chest and your shoulders, everything trying to stabilize a bar. And it was interesting. I'd never really had considered that before. And I read Dr. Mike Isertel's book, The Scientific Principles of Hypertrophy, and he he talks about he calls it the, the SFR, the stimulus to fatigue mm -hmm. ratio. You know, how much stimulus are you getting from that exercise versus what the cost of it is? And I had never really had thought about that or considered that before I had 
read his book and I just was just assume that you have to do these things. No, I think that there might be some value to them in the beginning when you first start training. Yeah. yeah. I, I think you need some, not need is a strong word and I don't like absolutes, but I think it's good to develop some basic level of strength and proficiency. Yeah, and some no, of course. Movements when you're young and you're not as injury prone. But I think for guys like you and I, I do a lot more stable movements, even unilateral stuff. Right. Well, but, I, but I can do pull-ups. I can deadlift. I can squat. I've done these things already. Well, just think about it. Like I was to a point where I was inclined pressing four or five <laughs> for reps, right? Yeah. Do you need to get that, stronger than that? Right. I mean, how much more am I going to progress with that? And yeah. what is doing 185 for reps on inclined barbell press is not that risky. Doing 405 yeah. on inclined barbell press is pretty risky as far as your joints and yeah. connective tissue, risking muscle tears, fatigue fatigue cost there's a there's you know so that's the thing to consider it's it is relative so when you're at the beginning and you're squatting 225 and benching 185 and deadlifting three plates that is not that high cost but you will reach a point when you become an advanced bodybuilder that you have to reconsider those things and you see it and this is another thing you'll see it the guys that continue to lift that way they get hurt and they end up having to retire. They tear shit. Everybody loves to point to Dorian Yates as the example, but I think that dude had to retire when he was 34, right? 35? Yeah, right. His bicep was hanging off one point. His tricep was torn during one of the Olympias. Yeah, he was just falling apart. Yeah, and he had a great physique. I'm not ripping on him. No, no, fantastic. Great, Dorian, that's, that's part of any... Dorian's my favorite bodybuilder of all time. I, I, I love him. But if he had when he had reached that point of being an advanced bodybuilder, if he had reformulated his training, maybe put a little more volume in and back off the intensity, maybe instead of when it would, I don't know what he won six Olympias or seven Olympias, I think. six, he might've won 10. You never know. Right. Could have. Right. I, Dr. Mike brought this up and I, I, when I had the interview with him and I never really thought about this before, but he talked about this thing called the survivorship bias. And where people see somebody, well, that guy did it. <laughs> the, you know, he he made it. But like like we said, he's one of in. You're not looking at the 500 that trained that way that had to drop out or quit because they got hurt yep. or because they got injured that never made it there. Maybe he just got lucky. And he, he didn't tear anything. And he didn't tear anything before then. Some of that, some of that goes with his genetics. Yeah. Right. So he was actin three dominant. Actin three is a gene that controls speed and strength. It used to be called the sprinter's gene. There is a relationship there with injury prevention as well. So they know that people that are more actin three dominant, which is produced in fast twitch muscle fibers, it equates to recovery ability as well. So right. part of the reason why I bring this up is it also goes back to pointing out the N equals one guy is he was a genetic freak. Right. right. If you were the best in the world at anything, you're a genetic freak. Yeah, so and that's why for the average person you can't even it doesn't matter what he did, what he ate, what he And that's why I, I tell people over and over and over again genetic outliers are not even worth considering. There's such a statistical anomaly that there it, it's really only the average person look is doing. If we want to have success at something, you probably should look at the mean first and work your way out from there. You may be a genetic outlier, but you, you don't know, know that. You don't know that. So I, I would start with what works for the most people first and then work back from there. Yeah. That's I think pro probably the most logical way to do things. Yeah. The, the, the question that people ask often too is how do you know if you're a genetic outlier? Right. I would say know pretty the quick way you would know, not my quote. Someone said you would be the biggest, strongest guy in any commercial gym within the first six months of lifting. If yeah. you were a freak. And that was, and that's the case with all those guys: Lee Priest, Ronnie Coleman, Dorian Yates. Well, I heard a recent interview with Dorian where he talked about he went to jail as a teenager, and there was a guard, prison guard there. I think they took an interest in in helping him with lifting weights, and he said within six months he was stronger than all the adults that were in the facility. So, and you see the pictures of him when he was a teenager that he was he was. I mean, you could already see that guy's got some potential. Yeah. 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 And that's why, but that's why we don't focus when 
you and I look at how we train, how we eat, we do these things. We don't necessarily look, I don't, I might out of interest, look at what a guy like Lee Priest did. It doesn't mean I'm going to mimic what he did because I Correct. can't mimic what he did. I would, yeah, be, I mean, it's, I would be it's interesting. It's fascinating. But I have people, people yeah, and then people love to point to the outliers as an example. And, you know, this, you know, hey, he did it. I, I should do it. And really, it's the dumbest way to look at things. It's like I, I always give the analogy of basketball because genetics are blatantly <laughs> obvious in basketball. The guy that's seven foot tall, you can look at him and say, oh, that, well, <laughs> like, what, what is it? Something like one in 250,000 people yeah. are seven feet tall. It's, yeah. it's and what, there's only 3,000 in the world or something. Yeah, there's only a, there's only a few thousand in the world. But, you know, you say, well, that guy plays this way. Maybe I should play that way, too. <laughs> if you if you try to play like Shaquille O'Neal, I mean, the guy shot 40% from the three free throw line is a career average of 45. Well, I don't know what it was. It was awful. If you were five foot ten and tried to play your game like Shaquille O'Neal, you're going to get your ass kicked. Yeah. Yeah. So why would you try to train like the genetic equivalent of a seven footer? But people do. But people do. Right. So another thing, too, with with bodybuilding training, this is another one that sort of drives me nuts is training specificity. This is another thing that I heard Dr. Israel talk about, and this is just another blatantly obvious thing. Bodybuilders, for whatever, seem to be bipolar when it comes to training. They're not sure if they're a power lifter. They're not sure if they're an Olympic lifter. They're not sure if they're a CrossFitter. They just go in the gym and wing weights around. You look at a power lifter, they train in a very specific way for their sport. Mm -hmm. All of them. They're not over there doing bodybuilding routines. They're training like a, or if they do, they do take a hypertrophy phase, but everything's very well planned out and phased. A CrossFitter trains very specifically for CrossFit. I don't know why bodybuilders try to do, or want to be bodybuilders, not the successful ones, try to train, like they're all over the place with their training. Like they're they're not sure if they're a power lifter, they're not sure if they're a bodybuilder or what they are. So train specifically for your sport. Our sport, it is hyper, really at the end of the day, we're trying to promote hypertrophy. So your training needs to be constructed in such a way that you're promoting hypertrophy in the most efficient way possible. Yep. Not promoting strength, not you know impressing your friends in the gym. It is to promote hypertrophy. And I don't know why bodybuilders, for whatever reason, want to be bodybuilders, don't, don't get that. Yeah, but in, and mostly the younger ones too, right? They're doing the one rep max on things. Yeah, you should never do a one rep max if you're a bodybuilder. I don't even know what mine is for anything. Like I get kids all the time asking me how much I bench press. I'm like knows? I have no fucking clue. I've been bench pressed in years. No idea. Zero. And that's no why you're clue. still doing this because you don't bench right. press anymore. Yeah, I, I, no idea. I don't know. I don't. I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody. When you get on the stage, the judge isn't asking you how much you bench press. He doesn't care. Well, because and, and in reality, people that haven't competed may not understand this. By the time you get on stage, you're pretty weak. Yeah. Right. If you're not, yeah, I'm in my weakest. Cramped up anyway. You you got nothing left. Yeah, you're at your weakest when you, you finish contest prep. You know, so that just goes to show you that. While strength, I think you do need to progress in a certain fashion, you know, where you can advance weights, you should advance weights, but it is within the constraint, constraints of our objective of promoting hypertrophy. So if my form is consistent, if my volume is consistent and it's becoming easier, then progress my weights, you know, so that's, but that's, that's, it's it's within that framework that I'm going to progress my weights. I don't get obsessed with it like I used to. No, yeah, I don't. Like I said before, I don't, weights are not necessarily something. I know what weights I'm lifting, but I'm not worried about going up in them necessarily. And people forget that there's different modalities of overload as well. Adding more volume is a modality of advancing overload. So if I am, it, this is another one that blows me away. So this is an example. You get the guy that's on exercise X and he's doing a hundred pounds for 10 reps and then does two force reps. So let's just say that anything within three reps of failure is, is 
is you know promoting hypertrophy I, actually it descends after you get past failure you'll see the the studies that show the curve that once you get past failure you're actually doing more damage than it's, a da- it's a literal damage it's a literal damage you're you're actually making things worse harder to recover and you're you've gone beyond providing this necessary stimulus to grow but you know if you do that one all out set you maybe have three effective rate reps with 100 pounds whereas if i kept one rep in reserve didn't blow out my CNS and did five sets with that re- with that weight. I'm actually I actually have more. If let's say I'm getting two effective reps to promote stimulus, I have ten effective reps with that same weight. I've done more effective reps to promote hypertrophy than you have. Yep. So Just, and there is there is an upper limit to where you can add volume to recover. Yeah. So but that and that's in, some of that's individual as well. Yeah, that is individual, and that, that's another thing. I, I hate to keep going back to Dr. Mike Isertel and his methodology. People think I'm an acolyte or whatever. I, I've read tons of stuff, uh, not just his stuff, but one of the things that I thought was interesting that he he quantified all of these different metrics. So there, we talked about the stimulus to fatigue ratio. Another thing he talks about is minimum effective volume. That is the minimum effective volume to... M- to stimulate growth, and then there is maximum recoverable volume, the maximum that you can do before you start digging yourself into a fatigue hole and actually cause more damage than what you can recover from. So there, there is this band that you want to live between. So, And a lot of times the way I structure my training, I'll do it in a five- or six-week block where I start off with minimum effective volume, and then I progress the volume up through the block of training until I'm close to where the maximum recoverable volume is. And then I'll back down, take a deload, I'll hit it again, and I'll maybe increase my weights and progress progress that weight with volume over over the next six-week block. That's that's how I sort of train at this okay. point. I do and something I, it, similar. I usually pick a body part or a group that's lagging, and I'll put more volume into that for a while until it's caught up and then, you know, keep yeah, it and I can't tell you how incredibly important form is too. And I used to be sort of like the guy, just sling the weight around and get as much weight up as you possibly can. And I'll give you a specific example of it. My arms were always a lagging body part for me. They never would grow. And this interesting thing, I, I have huge arms now. My arms are well well over 20 inches at this point. And how I got my arms to grow, people are all the time asking me about how I blew my arms up. I lightened the weight up and got better form. I was, when I sat back and thought about it, like when I was doing these heavy partial bicep curls, I noticed that my front delts got huge. <laughs> it, it was because I was basically doing a front delt curl. Yep. I wasn't doing a bicep curl. I was placing all the load on my front delts. That's why my front delts grew. Yep. You'll, you'll see it too, too. Like with guys that are heavy bench pressers, guys that they'll, the, you can see that they're not actually actually activating any chest at all. They end up having gigantic front delts or or triceps. So you look at powerlifters. Most powerlifters don't have big chests. Nope, they have big front delts. They, they have big front delts and, and big triceps, right? Because they're basically doing a narrow grip tricep press yep. is how they bench press, most of them. I was going to back up for a second just to clarify something. So where a lot of people go wrong because this was the explanation for the last hundred years was that muscle damage was what was causing growth, right? There were like micro tears and the body was repairing this. That is actual damage. That's not what we're looking for in the gym. That's not what anyone's looking for in the gym. It's similar to if you were in an accident or you got stabbed, that muscle's not growing back bigger and stronger. It's just going to heal itself. And a lot of times you'll actually impede growth because you'll put extra collagen in there to repair itself and then it can't really grow. Um, You and I will get into the, some of the, more of the physiology there on our learning modules, like the deeper yeah. end of that stuff. But just so people understand that that's, we're looking, you're just trying to stimulate growth. It's a, it's actually a chemical process. Yeah. There's a messenger. It's just looking for tension in this, yeah. end, but not, not, not actual damage. There are no micro tears. Yeah. I think most of the modern studies, it's more load time under load. Correct. Is what they've, the, the problem is it's technically not mechanical time. tension. The body has, it's just, yeah, it's there's technically no your body can't really sense time, but it needs a certain amount of tension. Mechanical on it. tension, yeah. Right, yeah. And it's not it's not on a sliding scale. Tension is either experienced or it's not. Right. So that's 
it, it there's a point where it's experience and it, you can actually work out to where the amount of reps where it occurs you know it a lot of studies show it's at like the last five reps in a set yeah and you can actually see it which is pretty cool when you like if you were to pick up something 20 times like let's say the last five or were the effective ones when the weight starts to slow down on its own that's when the tensions experience because you can see that your your nervous system right. is is responding to that right if you're and that's why if you were to just pick up a 20 pound barbell just curl it 20 times and just set it down it would never slow down there's probably no tension experienced right you know, it might be okay for warm-up set but it's not gonna actually do anything toward growth right you know as the opposite of failure so it's, it's too light too heavy you want to be in the middle yeah you want to be somewhere in the middle and i've also found that too that and this is where form changes from this is another one that i think guys get confused on we so we've established the tension is the important part when, when you're a power lifter and you're trying to get weight from point a to point b your objective is to put as little tension on the muscle as possible you're trying to be as efficient as possible right. for moving that weight from point a to b it is the exact opposite of what we're doing in bodybuilding we want to place as much tension as possible on the, muscle, yeah. on the working muscle to promote stimulus enough to elicit a hypertrophy. So yeah. it's the exact opposite of what we want for strength promotion, right? Yeah. Like you can see it, it again, bench press is not a fantastic exercise per se for hypertrophy, but you see it a lot in the bench press, right? Like if I'm going to flat bench, which I don't really do very often anymore, if at all, my back is flat on that pad, right? My legs are planted on yep. the floor square. My butt is on the bench. I place my arms in the appropriate place and I bench and I'm using just my chest, my triceps and my versus a power lifter. You see, they, they contort themselves under this thing and there's this huge arch, right? They're only trying to move the bar this far. Right. It's like, they're, it's like a decline thing. There's actually no chest used because they're trying to get up a weight, right? As efficiently as possible. Whereas I just want to place right. tension. All I care about is that tension. Right. So I might so bench significantly less than one of them, but my chest is twice their size. So that's why I say strength. I don't want to. I don't. I don't want people to get the wrong message that sh progressing strength isn't important. It is progressing strength within proper form to place tension on the muscle. So a lot of times, and, th and this is where you know I talk about ego lifting a lot. This is a lot of times where you need to put your ego in the back seat and take. I this, I went through this myself, man. It was it was it was hard psychologically to say shit. I'm doing too much weight. I pushed the logbook too far. I'm really like not placing any tension on my biceps. I need to lighten my curls up in half, do a full range of motion and make sure that I am getting tension on my biceps and not on my front delts. And lo and behold, when I did that, and then I started progressing the weight gradually through that improved form, they started to grow. It, it means that you may have to take a step back, use less weight, and fix your form and make sure that you're placing tension on the muscle. Like the muscle, and this is an oversimplification of it, but the muscle doesn't know what the number is on the it on the barbell. Same as it, it doesn't know time. It doesn't, you can't confuse it. It doesn't, these are not theories that your muscle understands. Oh, uh, don't even get me started on the muscle confusion thing. <laughs> that That drives me nuts. It's that, that I, hopefully people don't believe in that shit anymore, but. Well, I, the only time I see it is in my clients where I still program for exercise yeah. wise when they want to change programs. And I explain that there's a few times that are valid, right? If you have an injury, obviously you have to work. Yeah, right. Right. Injury. I think if you have a lagging body part, that's not responding, perhaps you then focus more on something else or a different movement, right? Like you're a lot taller than me. So an angle of something might work better for you than it does for me, vice versa. Like I'm much shorter than you, so I can squat where it's going to put more load on my, right. on my quads. I think you hit on hit the nail on the head, though, there w with something you just said, and that is you put yourself in a better position to place load. So I think that's what happens when people switch exercises. Maybe the exercise that they have put in place is actually placing more tension because it's wow. a mechanically a better a better um, exercise yeah. for for them. Correct. Yeah, I've, like like you know squats. People that that's a good example there. People talk about well, Tom Platt's. I'm, a I'm lot. five seven, so I I still I don't squat every week, but I still add it in my routine. But I'm designed to squat by my right. Feet. You can look at Tom Platt's. He's mechanically made to squat. I mean, his yeah. like body was like the perfect 
make up the squat and his squats were all quads whereas me i'm tall I have a long very team. long a very long torso for me squats are more low lower back yeah. right I'm, I'm a i'm about i have to lean over it's yeah, it becomes it's, a deadlift it's really just it's a good morning right yeah and, and, that, I, and that's why most great squatters throughout history are generally not your height right right they're like five four to five seven right and this goes back to the whole thing again where we're trying to place load on the muscle in a in a way that is going to be advantageous for growth not for leverage right so that that is i, I if, there, if there's one thing i could pound into people's heads when it comes to exercise selection and form is to find the exercise in perfect a form that you're placing the most load on the muscle and this is where i like people talk about the mind muscle connection and all that stuff i think that's really there's not some science to the mind muscle there's connection i think i think what it what people are they're just actually feeling tension being placed on the targeted muscle by correcting their form so if you have to use that psychologically to to get that i i think that's that's what we're talking about it's probably you know really if we were going to analyze it and peel back a layer of the onion that's what was happening there yeah well so and that with my muscle connection because that's another one that's not necessarily true there's really no there's no science between those no, there's two. Zero. It, it does make sense to focus and slow down and focus on what you're doing but a great example of that is a dumbbell pullover across a bench right yeah. like you feel that in your lats that's a pec minor exercise yeah so just because you feel something somewhere doesn't mean that's what it's working it now it does still work your lats to an extent they're supporting but they're not the primary driver in that thing but you don't feel your pec minor because you don't have a nerve there right that's it just comes down to where you have nerves so right. it doesn't mean that you need to yeah you don't need to get your head in that muscle per se to make it work correct correct i do think it's important to focus on form and make sure that you're getting tension on the muscle and yada yada so that's but and that's another thing too like uh people talk about the best exercise for X body part. The best exercise is the one that fits your yes. unique anatomy. Yeah. It'll be interesting. You and I will meet in person for the first time in a month from now at the Arnold of the lift. it will be interesting to see what exercises we do differently, or what we prefer, right? Because they're right. a different structure. There might be, there's probably some overlap, right? I think that there's some basic things that most people do. That are successful but it'd be kind of interesting to see depending on what we train what you prefer right your femurs are probably as long as my body i actually surprisingly have short legs for for a oh, tall okay. guy I'm, I'm I'm, saying, it's going to be interesting to see the way you line up in a machine versus the way i line up in yeah a machine. yeah and there's all sorts of things like i have impaired mobility on one leg stuff because i've had multiple knee operations and my ankle mobility is not the greatest because of sprain my ankles a bazillion times from playing basketball so there's all these little things that have impaired my ability to train legs but you figure out a way to work around it yeah so these are other factors that go into it but you know pulling back at the thirty thousand foot level once again i want to re-emphasize the need to train like a bodybuilder not to train like a power lifter not to train like a crossfitter your your job is to place stimulus tension on the muscle not to move weight from point a to point b in the most efficient way possible I mean, there is one other thing i i will say this almost any time that i see lagging body parts with people when, when people have when people ask me you know how do i bring up a body part they almost invariably want to throw more exercises more volume at it which 99 percent of the time that is not the issue with a lagging body part some of it could be genetic, but most of the time when I when I've had a lagging body part, and I, I'll circle back to it again, or when I see people that have lagging body parts, it's their form fucking sucks. Okay, they're not pl not placing tension on that muscle, so don't worry about adding more volume or training that muscle more frequently. If your movement pattern is incorrect and you add more volume or you train it more frequently, it's going to be the same result, probably worse. Yeah, because they're um, trained and and of. Injuries. yeah and, an, and another thing too that you have to consider with form and I, I i feel like i'm beating the dead horse here kurt but is protecting connective tissue in your joints when you're especially as you're aging as a bodybuilder 
pr protect, you know, if you're hurt and you can't lift a hundred percent, you're not going to grow. No. So if you're constantly battling with tendonitis and you're constantly getting injured or having muscle pulls or tears or shit like that, then something's wrong. You need to correct form, choose different exercises. So you can don't, this is another dunderhead thing that I see a lot of bodybuilders do. Like I, this one of my best friends, he's an exercise physiologist. And I remember going to him and telling him like, God damn, Mike, my elbows hurt from doing skull, cru skull crushers. And he's like, don't do skull crushers. Do something else brilliant right yeah yeah it's like find something that doesn't hurt and do that yeah. instead i was gonna say another one with um it, lagging body parts that i've seen work as well that people don't you see it a lot with calves right guys will complain that their calves won't grow yeah again there maybe there's some genetic thing i've never met anyone who couldn't grow their calves if they actually tried you ask them when they do their calves and it's always at the end at of the end of the workout day. well why don't you do them first or do them at a different day Right. If you, yeah. you prioritize something that's right. lagging, it's not necessarily going from doing three sets isn't working. So let's do 12 sets. It's perhaps you're doing it when you're exhausted on the heaviest day, lifting that you have, right? You've moved yeah. 20,000 pounds that day. You can go do your calves now. Yeah. The gas. Tank is empty. Yeah. So, also too, I think about calves. Where's the one exercise in the gym that you see most people doing shit form and ego lifting <laughs> calves. Calves. I don't know why guys feel the need to put every fucking plate in the machine on the calf raise. No. Or in yeah, the, in the gym. They're not that big of a muscle. Right. That is that is a prime example of ego lifting. I Like everybody I watch in the gym that trains calves, shitty range of motion, terrible form, way too much weight. And they don't grow. And they don't grow. And they yeah, wonder why. And then they do, they do three sets at the end of the workout. Here. Yeah. Your calf, it doesn't really matter once you're parallel and above. There's not a whole lot going on there. It's the dropping of the heel, right? Dante talked a lot about that. The it's stretch. the bottom part that matters yeah. for calves, at least. Not every muscle grows to stretch mediate hypertrophy, but calves do. That is one thing. God, I, I keep thinking about stuff, Kurt. I, I know you got to go soon, but no. I try to construct my workouts. This is another thing when I'm programming my workouts. Where possible, try to come up with exercise selections where I am placing load on both contracted and stretched positions. So, so an example would be for triceps, I might do a push down where, where the load is, is, is maxed at the contracted position and then maybe an overhead extension where the load is maxed at the, at the stretched portion of the exercise. And I found that you get more growth that way. Yeah. And there is some recent scientific, I saw some research re recently they were showing where, where that it does seem to be that it's, it's interesting because it's different from different muscle groups, but it yep. does seem that a lot of muscles tend to evoke more hypertrophy from load being placed in the stretch portion of the, of the exercise than the actual contracted. Yeah. It depends on the muscle, right? Like, yeah, but it is dependent upon that, the muscle. Don't necessarily, but also depends on where the stretch is occurring, right? Like, right it's maybe people might be going too far down with something where it's now actively insufficient. Well, like, to, to go back to that again. So another example, two other examples would be leg quads. So, mm -hmm. so for example, like on a quadricep exercise, leg extensions would be placing load at the, at the fully contracted sure. portion. The leg press would be at the fully um, stretch is placed on, on a, which is interesting because most people cheat on the leg press. They don't go down oh, that down, deep. Course, so they're time. really not even getting that much load on it. Another example would be hamstrings doing a stiff legged deadlift where the versus contract the hamstring curl versus the hamstring curl where the hamstring curl would be contracted. Stiff legged deadlifts would be, would be on the stretch portion of the movement. But I try to construct my workouts where possible One to each. One of each, right? I don't know how much of a difference that makes, but I, I, I think it does. With this regional hypertrophy too, you'll see in from certain movements like an RDL, you'll get more upper hamstring development near the glutes, versus yep. like seated one, you get more central or lower or yep. distal. Yep. But anyway, that that is a that is a, another thought. Yep. To Sissy consider. squats as well are great. You can do it with no weight and they put a huge amount of stretch in their quads. I always finish my quad workouts with sissy squats. Right. They are amazing. It's very humbling. With body weight yeah yeah they'll, they'll they'll yeah you don't even need any weight or even like the 35 pound dumbbell will nuke 
new Especially if they're pumped and you're done with your workout and you do them. Yeah. I feel yeah, like it, the hot dog going to tear. Yep. All right. Any parting thoughts? I'm sorry. I'm rambling no. a lot here. No. Um, to say no I think it was great. Training. I just was going to give, we, we could give a segue into our learning modules. Yeah. The, we have the science of anabolics in PEDs e-course up now. It's at my anabolic bodybuilding website. We've put a lot of work into it. A question I get a lot of people asking me is if the they are going to have access to additional content as we put it up. And absolutely, we're recording stuff weekly and adding adding stuff to the program. We want this to be the best one out there. Go check it out. Purchase it. I think you'll really enjoy it. We're putting a lot of effort into it. I'm very proud of the work we put into it so yeah, far. Definitely. Well, thank you, Paul. It's always a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you for cool, having guys. me. Thank you so much. I'll see you guys later.